Okay. Um, yeah, and thank you, Contesinos, for the very interesting talk. Uh, this will probably be a, be a bit uh, drier um, and perhaps also a bit confusing because I realized that this title is quite obscure. Um, so let's actually just start by getting into that. Uh, I should uh, give you a quick word of warning that my daughter uh, was supposed to be in nursery today. She is not for various reasons. Uh, so if she suddenly bursts through that door, we'll just go with it, okay? But anyway, back to this. So Bennett and Stein spring together at last. What, what do I mean by that? Well, it refers to two results from, I will say, reversible computation um, concerning essentially the same ideas uh, and the same spirit, but very different in their technical details. So one is, and this is Woody Steinspring, uh, Steinspring dilation theorem, which essentially states that any quantum channel um, is, is reversible somewhere. So it's conjugation by isometry uh, somewhere. Um, though, of course, that may introduce some other stuff that we'll then, then need to get rid of afterwards. Uh, and then the other result is, um, is Bennett's method or Bennett's trick, which concerns the, uh, the simulation of um, arbitrary deterministic Turing machines on reversible Turing machines. Uh, and again, it has sort of this, this same idea that, <clears throat> okay, we're producing some, some extra outputs that may not be desirable, but we just ask uh, whoever's you know, using this simulated machine to just forget about those. Uh, so what I'll try to convince you during this talk is that these two uh, results are in fact uh, so similar that we, we can present them in, uh, in the same uh, framework, which is that of uh, restriction categories. Um, and that is what the now kiss part of this meme is, uh, is all about. So, so let's get into this. Uh, first of all, what do I mean by reversible computation and, and by things being reversible? So, well, I think most of you, if you're familiar with computation, are familiar with deterministic computation. And what deterministic computation simply means is that, you know, if you're in some sort of computation state, then the next one is uniquely determined. So just by knowing the current computation state, uh, we can uniquely find out, find out, you know, what the next one is. Um, backward determinism is a bit more uh, exotic in that it states that the current computation state uniquely determines the previous one. So it can be that from two different uh, computation states, we can end up in the same one by going uh, forward by, by one step. And what does this have to do with reversible computation? Well, reversible computation is simply computation which is both forward and backward deterministic. Now, what are examples of these? Because that sounds you know, a, a bit strange or maybe a bit exotic. Well. I mentioned these reversible Turing machines before. In fact, you can pretty much define a reversible Turing machine to be a Turing machine with this property, uh, but also uh, something like quantum circuits without measurement, of course, because that's not reversible. But if you take quantum circuits without measurement, then really that's also a, uh, a reversible model of, uh, of computation, right? If you think of uh, computation states as the state of your system sort of between the gates, and you think of executing a gate, as um, a sort of going one computation state, then this is precisely a, uh, a reversible model of, uh, of computation. Okay. Now, what this is really all about is about the relationship between uh, reversible and irreversible dynamics uh, of classical and quantum systems. So uh, in, this, uh, in this talk, in this paper, I will look at basically four categories. Um, so two of them reversible uh, and two of, two of them irreversible. And of course, one in the, in the classical case and one in the quantum case. Now, if you look at the classical case, then the, the reversible one is the category of sets and partial objective functions. And the corresponding irreversible one is that of sets and partial functions. Now, partiality here is important because remember what Bennett's uh, method is all about is about Turing machines and uh, Turing machines are not guaranteed to, uh, to terminate. <clears throat> so that's, that's a source of uh, partiality here. Yeah. 
on the other hand, when we're dealing with something like quantum circuits, right, these are you know, unit series. So, so in a sense, like termination is, is guaranteed. So that's why we only look at the category of unit series, you know, which is finite dimensional Hilbert spaces in unit series. And sort of the corresponding universal one, which is of uh, finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and quantum channels. Now, by the way, I will use the term CBTP map and quantum channel interchangeably. I know that um, people sometimes define quantum channels slightly differently. I just define them to be CBTP maps. Okay, but really what we want to uh, look at here is what is the relationship not so much between uh, these categories, but rather between reversible dynamics and irreversible dynamics. And the, the idea is to come up with a categorical construction that sort of allows us to encompass uh, not just, say, Steinspring dilation theorem, uh, but also um, Bennett's method, such that basically we can describe, well, what does it mean to do irreversible things from reversible foundations? Okay, so let, let's actually look a bit more into these into these two methods. So, first of all, um, Bennett's method, as I mentioned, is a way of uh, simulating um, or describes a way of simulating uh, an arbitrary deterministic Turing machine, so irreversible Turing machine, uh, as a reversible three-tape Turing machine. So it needs some more um, uh, some more space to work on. And the idea is basically that um, uh, that we ask that these two extra tapes are just empty when we begin. Okay, so we put the input on the working tape and the two extra tapes just leave those empty. And then when looking at the result, we only look at the output tape and we disregard whatever is on the, uh, the working tape and the history tape. Um, and so the, the, the overall idea with Bennett's method is basically to produce a, um, a uh, reversible Turing machine, which takes an input and spits out, well, not just the output, but then also the, uh, the original input. Um, and it does so by basically by maintaining this history tape, which whenever the original Turing machine would perform an action. It not, it not only actually performs that action, it also writes down precisely what that action was. So that basically when we go to, uh, to reverse it, to, uh, to run it backwards, uh, we can sort of just look at the history tape and see what was done and then use that to actually, to actually undo what was done. Okay, so that was, that was Bennett's method uh, sort of briefly, uh, which is basically just a way of, of um, say reverse splicing programs, uh, classical programs. So what do we do in the quantum case? Well, in the quantum case, we use Steinspring's theorem. And if you ever wondered what happens if you combine uh, the Church of Mirkowski isomorphism with purification, what you get is precisely Steinspring dilation. Um, but what does that mean? Well, what it states is that whenever you have a quantum channel, um, say from you know some space A to B, right? Then we can also we can always write that on this form. So by conjugation with anisometry, and then state reduction. So in other words, whenever we have a quantum channel, we can always think of this as a you know a two-step process. So one uh, which does something reversible, but then again, as we saw with um, with Bennett's method, you know, in order to actually guarantee that this is reversible, we may have, you know, end up with some extra outputs. So what we'll do is that we'll need to sort of hide or forget about those. Um, fortunately, we have a way of doing this in quantum theory. Um, we just take the reduced state uh, using the, uh, the partial trace. And so that's precisely what the, uh, the second step of, uh, of Steinspring does. So, First, we do something reversible, and then we say, "Okay, actually, we end up we end up now in um, uh, in states that's that's a little too large." So what we do is we just reduce that, and now finally, the reduced state is um, is precisely what was described by this uh, this quantum channel lambda. Okay. Now, if we look at Bennett's method and Steinspring dilation theorem, uh, sort of from the high level, 
uh, we see that they have sort of two things in common, right? So they want both produce sort of extra outputs. These are really necessary in order to guarantee reversibility, but then also they have some notion of hiding, right? So for Steinspring, we had um, this reduced state, so this, um, uh, this partial trace, uh, and in Bennett's method, it's sort of more part of the protocol that we just instruct the user to, okay, there is this extra output, just forget about that. Um, and that sort of, you know, led us to a working hypothesis that irreversible computation, you know, whether it's actually classical or quantum, is nothing but reversible computation with a notion of hiding. So how do we actually test this? Well, in monoidal categories, hiding uh, is or well can be at least realized by projections, right? So you know, we have a monoidal product here, and we can sort of hide either part of this system, you know, just by taking the uh, the projections. Now, a sufficient condition for actually having these is that the uh, the unit is is terminal, and if it is, then we say that this is a so-called affine monoidal category. Now. There's a slight problem with this, and that is that if we actually look at one of our two motivating categories, which is sets and partial functions, um, then it actually does have hiding through projections, but the unit is not terminal. Um, however, it is sort of essentially terminal in the sense that, well, there is not a unique map from every object into, into the unit, but there is a unique total one. Okay? So it seems that we really sort of need to uh, look at a categorical structure that respects partiality in order to sort of fully uh, explain this. So, so let's do that. Um, the ones that I know best are restriction categories. So let's talk a bit about those. So a restriction category is basically a, like an axiom, um, yeah, mm, mm, I guess uh, an algebraic or like a uh, way of handling partiality. And, and what it does is that it assigns uh, to each uh, morphism, say A to B, a um, what's called restriction item potent, <clears throat> which, I'm sorry. <clears throat> there we go. Which we think of as a uh, partial entity, which is defined precisely where F is defined. So in particular, if F is total, then its restriction item potent is uh, just the identity, right? It's sort of defined everywhere. But of course, the idea is that, you know, you can also have, you know, partial maps, which then correspond to like partial identities. Okay, now any category can be sort of trivially made into a restriction category just by selecting um, the restriction item potent of every morphism to be the identity. Um, and indeed, that's what we'll do. In, in the quantum case, so for, for unitary and CPTP, these are restriction categories, but only sort of trivially in that everything is total, but that sort of also matches our intuition about how these work. Now, remember we had this, uh, th this problem with terminality where the, um, the unit in uh, sets and partial functions was not terminal, but sort of essentially. Well, we can describe this now in restriction category theory by saying that it has a restriction terminal object, which just means that there is a unique total map uh, into it for, uh, for each other object. Um, <clears throat> and now a monoidal restriction category is then simply just a uh, monoidal category, which is also a restriction category, which further satisfies that, um, that this uh, monoidal product preserves the, uh, the restriction item components. Okay, so to actually test <clears throat> this hypothesis, uh, we need to come up with some sort of way of like formally adding hiding to an arbitrary monoidal restriction category. So basically the idea is, let's say that we start with uh, sets and partial functions and we wonder, okay, or partial injective functions rather, and we wonder, okay, what actually happens if we add hiding to this? Does this actually get us all the way to sets and partial functions or what happens? So we have a construction for this it's called the aux construction, the auxiliary construction. And it works like this. So the objects of aux of C are just the, object, the objects of C. And now a morphism in this category is a pair uh, of an object G. We think of this as the garbage of that morphism. 
and a morphism you know, from A to B times G from the category below. Uh, so this, you know, <clears throat> this says that basically a morphism here is morphism from below, which additionally produces some garbage, but we sort of, we, we hide that here. Now, if we just stop there, then we would sort of have the, uh, the problem that there are like multiple ways of representing the same garbage, essentially. Uh, and we'd rather want that actually garbage is, is in a certain sense, um, you know, unique. So to, um, to have this, we need to, to quotient by an equivalence relation. Uh, and the one with we, that we do that is, uh, is the following. So we say that F with garbage G is, um, is below F prime with garbage G. If, first of all, if they're defined on exactly the same points, but also if I can mediate the garbage of F to the garbage of F prime such that this triangle commutes. So two morphisms in this category are equivalent if basically I can turn the garbage of F into the garbage of F primed in a way that makes this, uh, this triangle commute. Okay, so what does that actually give us? Well, um, it gives us essentially what's called the, uh, uh, the restriction affine completion. So a categorical com completion essentially answers the question, what is the least amount of stuff I need to add before I get property X? In this case, what is the least amount of stuff I need to add to my category before the, um, before the unit becomes restriction terminal? So um, first of all, it means that there is a functor or a monoidal restriction functor from our category C into this auxiliary category. Also, that this auxiliary category indeed satisfies the monoidal unit is restriction terminal, but also that it has this property that essentially, if you have any other restriction monoidal functor you know, from C to D for some other um, restriction affine monoidal category, then there's sort of a unique way uh, to factor that uh, like this. And um, and when we have this property, then we say that this is uh, this is a completion, um, or a um, we also call it the uh, the free uh, restriction affine um, category uh, for a monoidal restriction category. Uh, so this sort of answers the question: What is like what is the least amount of stuff I can add to get a notion of hiding in my category? And it turns out that if you start with the category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces and isometries, and you add hiding to that, then you get precisely the category of quantum channels, okay? Uh, this is a very nice result. It relies on a very, very nice result by, uh, by Hugh and Staten uh, a few years back. Uh, but I guess what is sort of more interesting is that, at least for, for, for this paper, is that the same does not work in the classical case. Okay, so if we if we apply this uh, this construction to sets and partial injective functions, then what we get is not equivalent to sets and partial functions. And why is that? Well, we would essentially want to identify morphisms um, if uh, basically if whenever we actually throw away the, their garbage, they behave exactly the same way. Right. So if this is this is satisfied in sets and partial functions, but this is not actually the case. And there is, uh, there's a counter example here, uh, which I don't believe I'll have the time to go through. Uh, it's also in, in the paper. Uh, but what it boils down to actually is, is the fact that in a sense, unlike um, in the category of isometries, uh, in the classical case, we actually have too much freedom of choice in revascularization. Whereas um, Steinspring with the, uh, with the minimal Steinspring dilation says that there is sort of an, an essentially unique way of revascularizing a, um, a quantum channel. In, in the classical case, there are sort of, uh, there are multiple different ways and they're not necessarily, uh, necessarily unique. Now, so how do we fix this? Well, essentially, 
what this comes down to is a problem of, of well-pointedness or of extensionality, because we notice that actually, if we just look at, at each point, so instead of looking at morphisms um, in Oaks of Pinch sort of on their own, we just look at them sort of point-wise. So we look at, you know, say the composition of a morphism with a point, then we see that we can actually always uh, make them equivalent sort of point-wise. So, and in general, this, this turns out to be a problem in, in, this, uh, in this category of Oaks of Pinch that it's not well-pointed. However, uh, sets and partial functions is well-pointed. So of course the two cannot be equivalent because well, one has this property and the other one doesn't. So let's just make it well-pointed. So we have a construction for that as well. It's called the X construction for extensional. And well, the idea is just to consider two morphisms to be equivalent if they agree on all points. That's it. Now, um, this also satisfies universal properties. So th this is also a uh, form of, uh, of completion. Um, but again, you'll need to look at, um, at the paper for details on that. Now, with this additional step of actually um, quotienting by, by well-pointedness, we get, first of all, that if we do this to isometries, then we still get the category of, um, of quantum channels. And that's simply because, well, we actually only need to do this step, but we have that the category of quantum channels is, is actually well-pointed already. So if we do this construction to it, nothing happens. However, uh, I guess what's more interesting is in the classical case, because if we now do this additional step of actually quotienting, then that gets us all the way to sets and partial functions. So now uh, these two uh, constructions actually provide sort of a bridge, not just from isometries to quantum channels, but also in the classical case uh, from sets and partial injective functions to sets and partial functions. Now, there's a bit of a snag here because what we actually wanted to know was the relationship between you know, unit series and CPTP maps and not isometries and CPTP maps. So for that, we'll need, well, an additional step. And it turns out that the additional step we need is the, uh, is the dual construction to our aux construction, what we call the imp construction for input. And basically the idea is that in, with the aux construction, we made the unit of the monoidal product uh, terminal. And here we observe that actually both pinch and unitary are rig categories. And what we duly do is that we make the unit of the direct sum uh, initial. And again, Hugh and Staden have a very nice theorem stating that if you do this to unitaries, then that actually gets you all the way to isometries. However, for sets and partial injective functions, uh, the unit of the sum is already initial, so nothing happens. Okay, so that actually means that sort of uh, that we get this. So when we put all of these together, that gets us all the way from unitaries to C CBTP maps and still gets us from uh, pinch to partial functions. Okay, now there's actually also an, a way to like essentially recover pinch and unitaries from um, PFN and CBTP uh, by taking what's called their co-free inverse categories. Um, you can look at, at the paper if you're interested for the details, but the idea is basically to take out what's called the partial uh, isomorphisms and, and these correspond precisely uh, or essentially to, um, to the things in the category that we started with. So in summary, um, well, one way of looking at this is that these are constructions where you start with some, you know, something reversible, um, and you, mo you, in a sense, want to, you know, turn it into the irreversible model that, um, uh, that you're familiar with. Uh, but I think for me, uh, the reading is actually maybe a bit the other way around. Actually, what, what this says is that, you know, whenever we start with one of these, 
um, one of these irreversible categories that we're familiar with, and we look at the morphisms in there really closely, um, actually, you know, we can see that, hey, it's, it's all reversible underneath. So yeah, I made a meme about that and that's it. Thanks.